Hi, I'm Eric Max, a Technical Program Manager at Loon and Alphabet. I've served on the National Advisory Board of the Union of Concerned Scientists, or UCS, for the past two years. Thank you for joining us today for a talk from the president of UCS on what we can learn from the COVID crisis to tackle the climate crisis. UCS formed 50 years ago after the advent of nuclear weapons to give scientific research a voice in global policy. Their mission is to combine the knowledge and influence of the scientific community with the passion of citizens to build a healthy planet and a safer world, which has brought them now to focus significantly on global warming. Today, I'm pleased to introduce the president of UCS, Ken Kimmel. Prior to joining UCS in May of 2014, Ken was the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and also served as general counsel at the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs in Governor Deval Patrick's administration. As an attorney, Ken decided to focus on his legal work on environmental issues after checking clerking for the US District Court in San Francisco, where he assisted a judge in a case involving the health effects of Agent Orange. Ken has been quoted widely including by the New York Times and the Washington Post. I know many in the Google community are looking for ways to help tackle these crises. This month, we've had five of the six largest wildfires in California state history, bringing hazardous air on top of an epidemic of respiratory disease. For COVID, Google has rolled out SOS alerts with internationally vetted science-based information and contact tracing functionality. To help tackle climate change, this past week, Google made a number of announcements, including carbon offsets for its entire legacy of operation as a company, a commitment to have all data centers and facilities consume only carbon-free energy 24-7 by 2030, and a commitment to create products that help 1 billion people make more sustainable choices. Ken and UCS have been at the center of science and policy throughout the COVID epidemic. I'm excited to have him here with us today to share what they've learned and how that can be applied to the decades-long fight to tackle climate change. Ken, over to you. Eric, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, and Eric, I just really wanna call you out. We have this national advisory board of about 100 people nationwide and uh, everyone is on that board because they're an energizer bunny of some way or, or, or another. But Eric, you're like at the top of the list. You've done so much for us and I love the way you've connected UCS and Google. So I really appreciate you uh, offering to host me for this and, and helping to, to bring it on. I'm excited to have this chance to talk to you all. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit at the end of the uh, presentation about Google's recent announcement, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't say how excited I was by it and inspired by it. And um, that's really terrific. So I'm gonna put some slides up uh, and, and, and get into my presentation. Whoops. Are the slides showing? Uh, hopefully they are. And can can Eric, can you hear me? I hear you. Uh-oh. Eric, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And were the slides up a moment ago? Yes, they were. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, I turned 60 uh, a few months ago. And, you know, that's always a time when one looks back a little bit. And I've recognized that over the 60 years, there's been periods of time when our country and the world have been in crises of one kind or another. But I have to say this year is unique um, in that we are literally going through four overlapping crises all at once. We have the COVID public health crisis. We have the climate crisis, which might have been knocked off the front pages by COVID for a little while, except they're right back front and center with the horrific wildfires that all of you have been experiencing out on the West Coast. We have the crisis of racial injustice and inequity, and we have the crisis of an economy that isn't working for so many people. So today I wanna to talk mostly about the connection between the first two crises, COVID and climate, and ask the question, what can we learn from COVID that we might be able to apply to climate? But you'll see as I talk about that and then think about the implications for political action, 
Um, you can't really even discuss those things without also factoring in the other two crises, the one of racial injustice and the economy. So I'm going to try to put all of those together in some fashion as we move uh, from considering the COVID climate connection uh, to the implications. So I, I think there are four really important connections between COVID and climate. Some are obvious, uh, some are not. And I think uh, given the importance of this pandemic, understanding those connections and being uh, fluent in how to talk about them, I think is really important. So the, the first connection, which is perhaps the most obvious one, is that science is literally a matter of life and death. And in this country, we have always revered science. We've always understood it's important. So that isn't new. But I think what is new is we have seen in the most powerful and visceral way that I can think of, what happens when science gets sidelined or suppressed? And it's good to remember that when the outbreak first appeared in China, the Chinese government was denying that there was a cause for alarm. Uh, when public health officials raised warnings, they were investigated and punished. And clearly China has come a long, long way since then. So I don't want to be seen as bashing the country. But what I do want to say is that the early uh, attitude towards the scientific evidence and the failure to get that information out clearly and accurately uh, really hampered the ability of the Chinese government to deal proactively with the problem. And then unfortunately, when COVID got to the United States, uh, we essentially repeated that mistake. Uh, we downplayed the significance. We put out uh, misinformation about how long it would last and who it would affect. And that uh, failure doomed in many ways our ability to respond effectively to COVID. And of course, when you contrast that to what some other countries did, like Taiwan or South Korea or New Zealand, you see that the effective responses to COVID um, are all rooted in a complete respect for science. And so I think it's just critically important that we recognize that and say it all the time when we're talking about climate, that uh, if we ignore science, if we sideline it, if we suppress it, if we politicize it, it is a matter of life and death also for the future of our planet. And so that's one parallel that's perhaps the most obvious one, uh, but one that we need to continue to talk about. A second one is the idea of flattening the curve. I do think that COVID has put that uh, into our lexicon, the idea of flattening a curve. What does it mean exactly? To, to me, it means taking early and decisive action to address a problem before the problem becomes an exponential one and before the problem outstrips our capacity to address it without terrible suffering. And so this is probably a graph you've all seen before. And the concept is that uh, there is a capacity of our healthcare system that's somewhat variable, but somewhat fixed. And the idea of flattening the curve is to get the rate of infection below uh, the capacity of our healthcare system. So we don't outstrip the ability of our system to deal with the crisis. Now, I think that is directly analogous to the climate crisis. And so that red line uh, is not the capacity of the healthcare system, it's the capacity of our atmosphere and our lands and our oceans to absorb carbon dioxide without a uh, temperature increase that puts us in a place where uh, we have outstripped our ability to adapt. And that temperature, uh, the world scientists have settled on it being 1.5 centigrade above pre-industrial times. So that's the red line that's analogous to the capacity of our healthcare system. And unfortunately for climate, 
we are not flattening the curve at anywhere near the rate we need to avoid going over that line. And so we're now at a point where the best we can hope for is to limit the overshoot of that 1.5 degrees, both in the extent of it uh, and the duration. So that's, that's the goal. But the point I wanna make here is, just as taking early and decisive action is critical in the COVID context to flatten the curve, it is uh, just as critical in climate. And so that's uh, another important thing we have to talk about as we talk about the, the parallels. Now, unfortunately, there are some key ways in which the climate curve is quite different than the COVID curve. Um, one is that the COVID problem, as serious as it is, is a temporary one. Most people believe that there will be eventually a vaccine or a treatment or some combination thereof, at which point COVID will have caused uh, great suffering, which is sad and regrettable, but it will disappear in the rear view window the way other viruses have disappeared. Of course, with climate, it's completely different. Um, we don't have a vaccine or a treatment. There are people who are looking at things like solar geoengineering and seeding the clouds to keep temperatures down or finding ways to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. But those are fairly far-fetched technologies right now, none of which we can count on. And so unfortunately, uh, the, the, the CO2 is a cumulative problem, not one that's going to disappear with time. Um, the other big difference is the time scale of the curve. When COVID hits a particular city, um, two weeks later, you see emergency rooms being uh, swarmed. You see hospital beds being uh, too full. You see doctors scrambling to treat people. There's a very direct uh, temp uh, temporal connection between the infection and the impacts. Now with climate, of course, it's on a completely different time scale, such that the horrible wildfires in California are caused by carbon pollution that was in the atmosphere for the last hundred years. So it's a much slower relationship between uh, the, the impact and, and crossing the red line. And so that makes it a very different problem. But I still believe that the idea of flattening the curve and the demonstration of how you save lives and save costs and save people by acting early is a really important one uh, that needs to be uh, repeated and talked about as we as we think about the parallels between these two. Now, the next parallel that I think is important is the idea of government, and in particular, government at scale. And I uh, gave away my age in the beginning, um, so I'll do it again. I remember very well when Ronald Reagan was running for president, he said that the scariest thing of all is someone showing up on your doorstep and saying, I'm here from the federal government and I want to help you. So that got a lot of laughs, but it was kind of a short, pithy statement for the reigning intellectual paradigm of the time, which I would call neoliberalism and the concept that uh, mostly what we should be doing is relying upon private markets to allocate resources. Uh, and to the extent that there is a need for government, most of that government uh, should be done at the local and the state level. And that rarely uh, is it a good thing for the national government to be mobilized. Um, so that has been a paradigm that has, la that has uh, really been the kind of the reigning paradigm for the last 30 or 40 years. And I would argue that COVID has completely blown that paradigm out of the water. Um, what it's shown, first of all, uh, not surprisingly, is the private sector itself um, cannot on its own solve the COVID problem. Although, of course, private entities are a critical part of this in finding vaccines, in, in developing supply chains, in uh, 
treating people who are sick. So the private sector is key, but it's no substitute for government. And I think it also shows that the level of government for a problem of this nature has to be federal. And we've experienced over the last six months, well-meaning states trying their best to do the best they can for their residents, but it puts them in a position where they're literally competing against each other to purchase PPE or ventilators, or one state will uh, have a lockdown, but the neighboring state doesn't have a lockdown. And the result is that no state can really go forward effectively without the cooperation of all. And that um, issue is directly analogous to climate policy in the United States. We have for the last four years had an absence of federal leadership um, on climate, the result is that states like California and a number of others have taken some really heroic and positive actions to deal with climate. But I think the graph that I have in front of you illustrates the downside or almost the futility of this, which is, yes, you have had California take some serious action to address its carbon emissions, but the state of Texas is regularly putting out double the amount of carbon of California, uh, carbon pollution. Or if you look at it from a per capita basis, you have big states like Texas and Ohio whose per capita CO2 emissions are roughly double those of California and New York. So the solution to this is the same solution as for COVID, which is there is no substitute for national action. Um, for government at scale, and it's the, at the level of the federal government where it has to be in order to actually solve this problem. And again, I do think that continues to distinguish the countries that have been successful at dealing with COVID, like Germany, has had a national response and hasn't left it up to each city and state to figure this out on its own. So. Um, I think COVID has very important lessons about the need for government and the level and scale that's actually needed to tackle the biggest problems. The final parallel I wanna draw between COVID and climate is universality. And there are really two elements to it. Um, one is, and this is where issues of racial injustice and economic collapse start to figure in as well. What COVID and climate, uh, what's true about both of them is that the effects fall uh, most disproportionately um, on the most vulnerable parts of our population and that we can't solve either problem for anyone without solving it for everyone. So in the COVID context, this is some recent data on how COVID has affected different sectors of our population. And you can see when you compare um, how it's afflicted uh, the black population to the white population, two and a half times higher cases, almost five times higher hospitalizations, two times the deaths. So it's clearly hurting the most vulnerable members of our population the worst. And that's true from a public health perspective. It's also true from an economic perspective. COVID has been a disaster economically for a wide range of workers, but it has clearly disproportionately harmed uh, black workers, for example, much more than whites. And that um, is again, directly analogous to climate. The people who are most vulnerable to the climate change to climate change impacts are people like outdoor workers who work in the fields who have to be outside in heat waves, or the urban poor who lack access to parks uh, and shade, or people of the middle class who have had their house burned down with no insurance payment and they have no other property and nowhere to go or people who live in low-lying areas and can't migrate away from them. So both of these uh, uh, afflictions are affecting the most vulnerable members of our society the most, and that is an unfortunate parallel 
between the two. But what's also, what's also an important parallel is that the solution needs to be universal in order for it to work. Now in the COVID context, we would never imagine developing a, fact, a vaccine and only giving that vaccine to the middle class and to affluent people. Not only would that be totally immoral, it also wouldn't work because vaccines by nature, in order for them to work, you have to cover virtually everyone in order to create the herd immunity that's needed to render the disease to, to eliminate it. And that is also directly parallel to the climate solution. So let me give you an example. Um, one of the things we need to do is electrify transportation in order to cut carbon emissions. And we've made some important headway, for example, with electric cars um, that increasingly are great cars with long ranges. They're great to drive. I have one, I love it. But let's be honest, only right now, a small percentage of people can actually afford electric cars. Uh, less than half of the population has a garage that they could park electric cars in to charge them. So electrifying transportation um, is not a solution unless we figure out a way to make sure that those vehicles, uh, which would also include school buses and trucks uh, and, and municipal buses are all electrified and benefit the entire population. So again, the parallel here is just as you can't solve COVID for anyone without solving it for everyone, you have to do the same uh, for climate. And that brings me uh, squarely to uh, a presentation on the implications for 2021 and the, the political strategy. And here I wanna say that I have had a bit of a conversion, uh, a, a conversion in my own thinking and my own theory of, of change. I used to very much subscribe to the idea that uh, change in Washington can only be very focused and very incremental, that Congress can really only do one thing at a time, and that if you try to uh, load up the level of ambition of legislation and pack a lot of issues into it, it will fail. And there are unfortunately many examples of that happening. But I think in 2020, we're in a different place. I think we have four crises rather than one crisis that we have to tackle. And I don't think that we will be able to do a climate bill standing alone that doesn't also address public health, that doesn't address racial injustice, that doesn't uh, directly address the economic collapse. And so I have come to believe that actually the, the, the solution that has the best chance of going through is one um, that tries to tackle all of those things. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that might look like, but I want to set the stage just by saying, just by identifying a little bit what the challenge is. So this is um, just some data that the red line is our actual United States emissions. Uh, the blue line is the international target. What that is, is the pledge we made as part of the Paris Agreement to get our emissions 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by, uh, by 2025. And you can see the jury's out on whether we're going to get there or not. Uh, I, I happen to think we probably are not going to quite get there. Um, but that doesn't really matter. What really matters is to hit that 1.5 degree target that I talked about earlier. We need to be, as a country, we need to be at net zero by mid-century. That's, that's where we have to, to go. And I want to just give you a sense of the scale of ambition that would be needed to get there. Um, so I'm going to do that uh, at a broad level by talking about some principles that many people who have studied decarbonization, deep decarbonization, have come to. And the basic consensus is that to get to net zero by 2050, we will need to have an electric grid that's uh, virtually entirely carbon free. And it will need to be about double, and some people would say triple the size of its current size so that once we've, we're running the grid on clean energy, 
we can then electrify virtually all end uses like transportation, like heating, like industrial processes. So the challenge here is to literally decarbonize the grid and double or triple its size in 30 years. Um, we have never had a mobilization of that kind um, and the ambition is fairly overwhelming. So here's what this would look like on the ground if we were to assume that renewable energy will be 80% of that grid by 2050. That's about a middle of the road assumption. There are some people who think it will be or should be 100%. There are some who think it should be 50%. So we'll go with 80%. And this is what I wanna show you um, to get to a situation where we've doubled the grid and where renewable energy is 80% of the grid by 2050 implies taking some of the best years we've had of building new wind and solar and doing that every year for the next number of years, doubling, tripling, quadrupling it, those numbers over the next 30 years. So this is just a, um, a mobilization that we've never been able to pull off before, but it's the mobilization that we're going to need to get there. And to my mind, this simply will not happen under current laws and regulations, no matter how much the state of California or New York or Massachusetts try to make it happen, uh, no matter how much the Googles of the world increase demand for renewable energy, um, we're not gonna get there uh, without uh, an effective federal presence on climate. And I would also say that we're not going to get there through executive orders and regulation. That's what we tried with Obama. Um, and what we learned the hard way was if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And we're now in a place where most of the climate regulations that the Obama administration put into place either have been or uh, by the end of the term will be erased by President Trump. So um, that's a long way of saying that the holy grail here has to be durable, comprehensive climate legislation at the federal level to mobilize the country at the level we need uh, to meet that ramp up. So how do we get there? Um, well, let's assume, first of all, for sake of discussion, that the November election uh, yields a President Biden, a Majority Leader Schumer, and a House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, I realize that is not uh, any guarantee, but let's, let's talk about it in those terms. Uh, I think the good news is um, we could expect the House of Representatives to pass ambitious climate legislation. Um, there has been a House Select Committee that's been working for the last two years to develop that legislation. They put out a blueprint several months ago, and it is at the scale uh, that we need. So that's the good news. So I think we could see an ambitious climate bill get through the House. The Senate is where uh, it's going to be much harder. Most people feel like the most likely result if the Senate flips is the Democrats will have a one or maybe two seat majority. So there will be um, some democratic senators from fossil fuel states who will be skittish about uh, climate legislation. There'll be Republican senators who um, will oppose it. So how do we get out of this uh, knot? How do we untie it? And I think we've got to remember that we are in a crisis right now that shows no signs of letting up uh, for many people, the economy is in tatters. They desperately need uh, jobs. They need a livelihood. They need a solution to economic inequality. We need to address the racial injustice problem and the facts that I've shown before about how climate change and COVID is disproportionately harming their populations. And what I think all this leads to is we have got to look at 2021 and 2022 as the years in which 
we start a, a, a massive mobilization, which is both an economic recovery and a climate justice and a public health solution. Um, and so we've got to get out of this framework where we're talking about making progress on the economy, being at odds uh, with the climate. I think it's exactly the opposite. What we've got to say is the transition to clean energy is the linchpin through which we bring the economic, the economy back. So I think that is the synthesis of all of these things that could, could make this possible. Now to do this, we have to do a bunch of things. I think we need some new allies. Um, this is a picture, this is typical in the Great Plains and the Midwest where ranchers and farmers are earning economic value from wind turbines. Um, these folks are natural allies of this transition to clean energy. I don't think we've begun to sufficiently tap in um, to that uh, group of people as a resource. I also think that there is very rapid job growth in solar panels and weatherization. And these are jobs that can't be outsourced, that are available for uh, people who live in cities who don't have gainful employment. So that is going to be part of the strategy. And we have to address, this is a picture from Katrina, the uh, way in which federal resilience and adaptation dollars are not going right now to the communities that need them the most. But there is a lot of economic growth that can be had by um, creating resilience and adaptation uh, for communities that are the most vulnerable to climate change. Um, and finally, we need a partner with real economic clout. And to my mind, the future is going to be a battle between electricity and oil. If oil wins that battle, we're well above 1.5 degrees. We will not have flattened the curve. If electricity wins, we have a shot at it. And so the entire electric utility industry from the power generators to the uh, utilities to the to all really need to see that their future involves this massive decarbonization um, and expansion of the electric grid. So to me, uh, this is the way to be thinking uh, about the political strategy as one that is highly intersectional, to try to solve these problems all at once rather than putting them into their own separate silos. And it recognizes that what we've learned from COVID the hard way can be applied to problems like climate change. So I'm going to stop there, but I did want to um, add one final piece, which is I do want to go back and um, applaud Google uh, for its long history, actually, of being a leader on climate. And I was particularly impressed by the announcement last week that Google is going to uh, attempt not only to be carbon neutral on a net annual basis, but to do that, as I read it, uh, every hour of the day, which I think is um, really inspiring. Um, and I, I think it could potentially be a pilot that will demonstrate the solutions that need to be done to really have high levels of intermittent resources like solar and wind into the grid. So I really applaud that. Uh, and I wish it every success. But I'll close by 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 mixing that praise with uh, a, a bit of a challenge to Google as well. And this is the final way that I think there's a parallel to COVID and climate. Um, I was very impressed by Google's uh, sense of civic responsibility when it came to COVID. And in particular, um, the actions it took, as I understand it, to deplatform YouTube videos that seem to be directly issuing misinformation on COVID, on things like the treatment, the prevention, the diagnostic, the transmission of it, um, deplatforming YouTube content that directly contradicted authoritative science. I think that was the right thing to do. Um, I think that is quite analogous to climate, um, where we have uh, the continued presence of climate deniers who are putting forth content 
that is directly contrary to authoritative sources like the United Nations uh, framework on, on climate change uh, and various other scientists. I know that there is a healthy debate about climate change. There needs to be a healthy debate. Different views uh, need to be heard. There isn't one solution. But just as it hurts all of us to have people put out content that directly uh, conflicts with authoritative science when it comes to COVID, I would say the same is true for climate. And so I would urge Google as it thinks about uh, citizenship and corporate responsibility um, to think about whether there is a parallel between what it did when it came to COVID and what it could do when it comes to climate. So I've talked uh, more than I should have. I'm gonna stop there and we'll gladly take some questions. Great, thank you, Ken. That was uh, uh, incredibly eye-opening. And uh, I wanna invite um, everyone who's watching, if you'd like to join in the, in the chat uh, to ask Ken some questions, we'll take some directly from the chat. Um, but before we do that, I, I was really struck um, uh, by this initial parallel between COVID and, and climate, both being incredible disasters, but COVID being so much more fast moving. Um, people can see the, the human toll, the death toll in front of them uh, every day, especially when we were uh, hitting the top of the curve earlier this year. And I'm wondering in all of your experience with uh, working on climate change policy, do you see a tangible immediate disaster being what's necessary to push climate change into the national conversation and to get major legislative action? So Eric, I hate to say this, but the answer is yes. And I hate to say it because as a human being, I never want to take advantage of suffering. Um, it feels wrong at so many levels, but the unfortunate reality is that because climate change is a slow moving crisis on a very different time scale from COVID, and because there's so many other problems that people have in their lives and we have at the governmental level, unfortunately, it does seem to me that in order to move on climate, we do need to have rather constant reminders of what the downside is of inaction. And unfortunately, um, we, we are seeing those reminders now all the time. Um, and it is driving public opinion. It's changing people's views about the urgency of the issue, and it is contributing to a political consensus that we need to act. Um, so unfortunately, these natural disasters are atrocious in their effects on people and communities, um, but they do have the uh, they, they are energizing and mobilizing people. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, and maybe a little less sobering, um, the, uh, I uh, appreciate that you, you, your, your point about us needing to, to tackle climate change with an equity lens. And uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the kind of scientific backing for, for why that's an advantageous way to go about solving this problem. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think the thing about climate change is, is that when you talk about impacts, the average impacts, it obscures the severity of the, uh, the way it impacts certain communities and certain geographic locations. So when we talk about 1.5 centigrade increase, you know, globally, that doesn't sound like that much, but that's four or five centigrade increase, you know, in the North Pole. Um, and so we're seeing much greater impacts at the extremes than, than at the average. And the same thing is sort of true from a social science perspective as well. Um, I talked about how climate change impacts are harming the most vulnerable people the most. Um, I think that science can play in a really important role in highlighting what those impacts are and in getting us away from thinking that the problem to be solved is the average impact. The, the problem to be solved is the extremes. 
And um, so that's where I think science can do a very good job at documenting the way in which climate change impacts are being felt in different locations in different ways. Great. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think I'll take a couple of questions from the audience um, uh, at this point. Um, would, uh, I, okay, we've got one here about uh, your, a uh, couple people asking about what you think of the Rewire America plans. Uh, question from Lenin. Um, I, I, I'm not that familiar with them. I've heard about them. Um, I do think that, uh, I think that the Rewire America is all about transmission, right? Increasing electric transmission. Uh, I believe right? so. Yeah. I mean, it's a critical part, you know, I showed that chart of solar and wind. Of course, it's not just about um, building the generation facilities, it's connecting all of those facilities to population load center. So here in New England, where I am, our biggest challenge is laying a great amount of transmission lines in the ocean because offshore wind is our ticket to a decarbonized economy. Um, in California, you know, it's solar panels in the desert, in the Midwest and the Great Plains, it's wind farms on the plains. Um, all of these uh, areas are similar in that the generation isn't happening right at the uh, load centers. And so an awful lot of transmission needs to get built. Um, and that is part of where I see the economic uh, benefit as well, all the jobs that can be created um, in, in doing that. Thank you. Um, uh, I see, see a couple questions. Uh, um, I think one from Abe uh, here, um, uh, really uh, asking about your your mention of um, you know uh, state versus national, and how does that expand to um, you know one nation versus the entire world? Yeah, it's such a great question because you're absolutely right that just as you can't solve climate for the United States with individual states like California being heroic and others not being. That's obviously true from a world perspective as well, um, which of course is why it was so devastating beyond belief that uh, President Trump decided it was a good idea to, to try to pull us out of the Paris Agreement. Um, I don't know that the UN is really capable of uh, being the institution that can corral countries together. I think it's going to have to come from international leadership among countries. So I think the model of effective leadership was what uh, Obama and, and she did um, to pave the way for the Paris Agreement by both countries agreeing to make some significant changes. I think that needs to be done on a ground on a grand scale. I think the G7 and the G14 are institutions that might be capable of doing that. Um, but we absolutely need it. And I know I've been focusing on the United States because that's where UCS works and that's what I've thought the most about. But there's no question um, the climate crisis is not going to be resolved uh, as long as, for example, China and India are continuing to invest heavily in new coal plants, which they are. So your point is really well taken. Thank you. Um, uh, a question from Zoe. Uh, what are your favorite resources or conversational gambits that you've seen successfully persuade or activate people who believe climate change is real, but haven't grasped the urgency of the issue? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm going to answer it, but I want to, here's the question I'm glad you didn't ask me, which I often get, which is what's the best way to convince a climate denier that they're wrong? Because the <laughs> answer I usually give is there actually isn't really a way to do that. Hmm. And it's not worth the time. What's really worth the time is, is getting the people who essentially accept the science, um, but haven't yet felt the urgency of it. So this is where, uh, unfortunately, as you asked, Eric, all of the various disasters that we're seeing in the form of wildfires and hurricanes and floods and droughts um, are the things that we need to point to over and over again 
uh, and we need to link climate change in a responsible way to those things, which also, by the way, it means admitting that these things happen without climate change. Um, and it's a mistake to over way because you lose credibility. But what is true um, is climate change makes all of these things much more likely to happen and much more severe when they do happen. And having some fluency with why that is, I think is really important so people can connect the dots. Um, but I also think, and I guess I was doing a, 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 a tryout of this, is we link it to the COVID flattening of the curve. And we say, just as in COVID, we needed to act really quickly to wear masks and socially distant and do those things, even though they were uncomfortable for us, we saved lives in the long run by doing it. We got to do the same thing here. It has the same level of urgency, even if it doesn't always feel like it does. So those are some of the ways um, that I try to do it. And then the other piece, which I think everyone understands and relates to is the grave intergenerational injustice of this. And the idea that we, and I mean we like people my age, have not attended to this problem and we are leaving behind a world that is going to be degraded for our kids and grandkids. Because most people my age choke up when they think about that and they want to do something about it. So I also talk a lot about the generational injustice of all of this. And that's why I think, for example, people like Greta Thunberg are very, very persuasive spokespeople. Yeah, yes, definitely. Um, and and uh, I guess maybe even taking that uh, more extreme, uh, some, uh, Sandeep asked, uh, imagine you're making a pitch to Mitch McConnell in 2021 for drastic climate action. How would you go about convincing him? <laughs> well, I'll give it a try, but I have no illusion about the ability to succeed there. I unfortunately have come to a place where I think he is beyond uh, persuasion. Um, but I guess I would try a couple of things. First of all, I'd talk about Kentucky and what has, um, what's really happened in Kentucky. And what's really happened is mostly for economic reasons, a little bit for climate reasons, the coal industry is shutting down. Um, and people in Kentucky are out of work. Uh, they don't have high levels of education, they don't have access to health care, um, and fossil fuels are not going to bring their economy back. And so just from a purely economic basis, even if you don't think climate change is real, or you're taking so much money from the fossil fuel industry that you can't say publicly that you think it's real, just from an economic perspective, the future of Kentucky um, lies in, in, in solar panel power and wind energy and transitioning out of these polluting uh, enterprises into, into cleaner ones. Um, so I would say that to him. Um, I would try to prevail on him to think about his family and his kids and his grandkids and, and, and the future. And I guess the final bit would be I might ask him, you know, Senator McConnell, do you do you have fire insurance on your house? And so he'd probably say yes. And I'd say, well, you don't really think your house is going to burn down, do you? And he'd probably say no. And I'd say, but you're doing something. You're paying money now to avert that risk because you don't actually know if your house is going to burn down or not. Um, and so that concept of we pay something to, to alleviate future risk has got to be something he understands at some level. So I would try those things. Um, I, I don't know that they would work, but uh, if I guess if I had that chance, I would try. Maybe you can come up with something better. <laughs> uh, well, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll cer certainly be brainstorming. <laughs> um, but uh, I, uh, we do also some questions that are that are about kind of your your your, your tangible suggestions, uh, especially from uh, the work that UCS does as an organization to advise on the best policies. Um, uh, we have a question from Paul Marks. Um, 
how should the world be dividing investment dollars between renewable generation, nuclear generation, and storage? Well, uh, I personally believe in an all of the above of those three. Um, nuclear power is a bit of a third rail with a lot of people, and there's people at UCS who actually have very different opinions of it. Um, uh, I think we've got to move forward with all of them. Um, I think the good news is we've got the technology set for wind and solar right now. So we can really like start ramping up that curve right away. Um, investment dollars do need to go both public and private into that. And we can make huge uh, impacts by scaling up renewables right now. Um, at a certain point, and I can't say exactly where that is, we're going to need either storage or nuclear or both to deal with the fact that wind and solar are intermittent resources. Um, so at a minimum, and we've said this publicly, we feel like it's really important to preserve the existing nuclear capacity as much as we can, especially for plants that are being safely run. There are some that just need to be shut down for safety reasons, and that comes first. But for the ones that can be safely run, we have to keep them going. And I think for future nuclear power plants to be built, there does need to be a breakthrough in technology and cost because they're too damn expensive right now. And they take too long to get built. And there's too many unanswered questions about, uh, about uh, nuclear waste and whatnot. So I, I am hopeful that just as uh, the battery industry, uh, the wind and solar industry have innovated and gone down the cost curve and created solutions. I think we really need to see that on the nuclear end in order for it to be a big a big part of the solution. I am very open minded to it. I would cheer it on. I hope it happens. Um, but yet not we're not there yet. On storage, kind of the same thing. We uh, obviously have largely tackled the issue of energy storage for, for cars. Um, the lithium ion battery works and, and delivers uh, power at the, at, at, at the scale we need. It's too expensive, so we need to come down. What we haven't yet uh, solved is the problem of grid level energy storage, storage that can cost effectively store energy for several days or a week or a couple of weeks. And that I think needs massive uh, research and development, uh, public and private investment. So I think all three of those technologies are vital. Some are really available now and we should be going gangbusters on scaling those up. Others are gonna take a little time and we need to go gangbusters on investing in the research and development so that we're ready uh, to deploy those in a matter of years. Thank you. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're just about to um, have to wrap up. I, I really uh, appreciate the uh, presentation and the um, uh, really illuminating answers. I, I do want to um, ask you one final question before we go, which is what are the best actions that uh, people viewing this, uh, whether at Google or outside, can really do to help uh, tackle this crisis? Well, um First of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. The election's 40 something days away. So vote, make sure your friends and family vote. I am concerned that absentee ballots are confusing for people. Um, I think that there is a lot of volunteer work that needs to get done to make sure that uh, people have their ballots. They know what to do with them. They know how to fill them out. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities for important volunteer work. It's going to be different than knocking on doors, but probably just as vital. Um, in terms of ways that you can reduce your own carbon footprint, um, getting an energy auditor for your house and weatherizing it uh, is, is a big one. Uh, switching to an electric vehicle, if you can afford it, and 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 is, is a big one. I I did a little self calculation. My uh, my footprint was at about ten tons a year, which is still a lot. That's like four x, you know, the rest of the world. But I I went I went from ten to six by switching to an EV. That's a pretty big 
that's a pretty significant. Um, and I live in Massachusetts where the grid is very clean as, as is true of California. So you get a lot of bang for the buck by switching to an EV, um, putting solar panels on your house if you can, or buying into a community solar program is, is a big one. Um, getting red meat out of your diet, which is good for the environment and for your health. I haven't completely done that, but I'm moving that way and uh, I've become a huge fan of Impossible Burgers, which is not far away from, not that far away from Google. So I think there's some really good substitutes if like me, you you like meat. Um, and then I think the, 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 the key thing is if the wind and the sun and the stars align in 2021, all of us, need to be unbelievably vocal about this, that we've run out of time. Climate change can't be a, a backseat issue. It's got to be priority number one with an economic recovery uh, and other things, and that we will not accept failure from the Congress because we may only get two years to get this done. So those would be some of the things I would urge all of you to, to think about. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, 2020 has been a, uh, a, a, huge, <laughs> a very impactful year, um, but uh, I, I'm really glad to hear that there's a huge opportunity for 2021 to also be uh, impactful, but positively so. Positively so. Eric, thank you so much. And thank you all for, uh, for listening and your good questions. And uh, I wish you all well. Thank you.